Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Big Picture Film Club podcast. My guests today are part of the creative team behind the independent feature-length film Scales. Scales is an upcoming thriller uh, following a chaotic night in the company of a boxer, his PR manager, an entrepreneur, and a drug dealer. With me, I have uh, Anthony Vander, uh, who serves as the film's producer and co-lead, and Nathan Hanawin, who is the film's director. Uh, the film is written by Joe Harvey. Uh, Anthony, Nathan, welcome to the Big Picture Film Club. How are you doing? Thank you. Very well, thank you. It's a pleasure Thanks to be for having me. <laughs> um, I thought what's interesting is kind of going over your backgrounds. Although, uh, Anthony, you are like, you know, the producer, co lead, um, and Nathan, you're the director, you, both of your backgrounds, you've kind of chop and change like you kind of wear multiple hats depending on the project um one thing i wanted to kind of explore is you know is that um do you find that increasingly like a new sort of phenomenon uh, among like the, the the new age of filmmakers who can kind of you know kind of shoot for themselves where it's actually you're forced to wear different hats more often than not rather than kind of specialize and just be like i'm just the guy that's filming or i'm just the guy that's directing i think uh, anthony do you want to start on that one or um yeah i mean with regard to that i think it's it's really important that and i've spoken to nathan about this and joe and i think in terms of this kind of independent age or this you know, the filmmaking industry, I think it's important to just try everything. Um, it's not necessarily that you will excel in everything. Um, maybe you will, maybe or you'll find it challenging, but I think if you don't, you know, pop on your phone, you can use the iMovie, try editing, you know, on your iPhone. There's so many ways which you can create film nowadays. You don't just have to have a, you know, a DSLR or a red camera, you know, there's so many ways um, in terms of acting. You don't need an audience to act, you know, you could, you can practice in your room, you can practice with a friend. So I just think the options in terms of like chopping and changing, I think you really can find your craft and owning your craft if, 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 you, if you try everything. So, um, it is challenging, but you, you usually find out more about yourself. So I think that's what I'd say about that. Yeah, no, I agree, agree with Anthony, especially, you know, as you said, it's, it's when you're young, trying things out, you know, really learning what you're good at. Mm -hmm. So the first things I kind of done, you know, I was shooting and editing myself. And that got me, you know, to learn a lot about directing, especially learning some of the editing side. So, you know, I know what I'm shooting. I'm not going to be shooting too much. Um, you're not shooting cover just for the sake of it. You want to be confident in what you're getting. But although kind of now I'm trying to do less of that, I'm just trying to focus more on the directing um, with some producing as well. Um, but I think, yeah, at the beginning point, definitely it's so good to try and try as many things as possible. Find out what you like, find out what you don't like, especially, and then trying to refine your skills into, into one, mm. one pathway, one, maybe two pathways. Um, yeah. Kind of going uh, kind of uh, over our email threads. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this, your film Scales um, is quite literally been years in the making. Uh, so three and a half years, I can't, probably longer than that, but uh, it'll be good to hear like the initial inception of the idea. And, um, you know, given this is like, you know, I, I assume self-funded, uh, like independent film, how do you have how do you how have you fostered that sort of staying power to kind of you know three and a half years down the track kind of making sure this film gets its release because i think that's a very important part of the filmmaking process is having that perseverance and staying power to kind of see this project through mm. so i mean in terms of the initial idea it was it was joe I came to Joe with an idea because me and Joe had collaborated with um, a feature that I'd acted and directed, which he'd wrote, which was Sweet Boy, a mm -hmm. film called Sweet Boy. And we had some success with that. I mean, we took it to American Black Film Festival. We had a 
you know, we were broadcast on TV, London Live. So we just wanted to, we wanted to collaborate again. We had a, we had great chemistry. Um, so I came to the, um, to him with the idea of um, a feature film, which is set in an enclosed space. Initially, it was, it was going to be a lift. And Joe was like, nah. <laughs> feature film set in a lift that's just not going to work I didn't even know that, I didn't know that myself it was, yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was initially set, meant to be set in a lift but then you know, after a lot of discussion we came to the conclusion that it would be set in an apartment and then from there kind of Joe did his thing you know, we talked about characterization, kind of built up this storyline, this thriller. We thought about films that we liked, such as, um, you know, Rope, uh, 12 Angry Men, these kind of rooms that, you know, they're, they're primarily set in one location. Mm -hmm. um, it's very deep on, you know, storyline and characterization. And then from there, we were looking for a filmmaker and, uh, we had like a lot of applications, a lot of people with a lot of different ideas. Um, and we saw Nathan's application and we'd seen the work that he had done with um, I Will Never Run and also Sleep and Mods, which was completely yeah. different to I Will Never Run. Um, a documentary, you know, set on this band, which had done incredibly. But after when I watched it, it was, you know, it was reminiscent that you know, again, saying he's got more than one string to his bow. Hmm. And we just liked it, uh, Nathan's energy, his passion. And yeah, from there, that's when the film really got going. Um, with regard to the three years... <laughs> <laughs> and a half, and a half. <laughs> Jumping ahead, three years. I think with it, you know, we had a lot of things like reshoots, um, you know, the budget. We, were, we, we literally, this film was... We, we it was crowdfunded so the initial okay. crowdfund was 5k um but going into post you know we needed much more money so there was that and then after that after creating the film getting a distributor doing festivals so we finally found the right the distributor that was right for us um mm -hmm. who was gonna you know, distribute in many territories. So yeah, I mean, it's it's a long process, but again, it's like when you're writing a film or when you're, I don't know, directing a film or producing, you can either stick with it or you can just give up. And I, I think with the team that we had on board and with Nathan's energy, you know, we couldn't just be like, oh, this is it. And then just leave it. We, you know, the, a lot of people would put a lot of time, a lot of effort and a lot of energy. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's a story, that's a story on my end. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think, well, you know, as Anthony said, I met Anthony and Joe, I think, well, I met you at the Curtain in Soho first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, obviously, like, getting the film, getting it made, like, shot, well, it was kind of the easy part. That seemed to go together mm. pretty straightforward. It was just kind of the post and everything since then, which is always, you know, a long part of the filmmaking process anyway. Because, with, you know, other things are happening in our lives, everything's going on you know, they slow you down, obviously, but we've shot the film, I mean, we've done the biggest part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, why would you leave a film that you've shot? You've spent all the money, everyone's put their time in. Why why leave it there, do you know I mean? You know, it's a great film, we want people to see it, so it's just that drive, that constant sort of push. You know, sometimes things go quicker than other things, you know, there's other things that get in the way, unfortunately, but you know, COVID, <laughs> one of the things mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, life always throws you a curve. But it's just, you know, you, we've done the hard bit. Now we just got to go that extra one or two percent to get it out and get people to see it. Um, on that note, like you kind of spoke briefly about the budget and, um, yeah, it's a very modest budget and you've, it's great that it's crowdfunding. How do you, how do you budget a feature film on a relatively small amount? Um, yeah. We were quite lucky with certain things. So the location uh, that we had, the apartment that it's all shot in, is that we actually got that for free and it was actually above a pub. Um, okay. uh, I knew the landlords and he just did, let us use that place for free. So that was great, you know. You know something like that could normally cost, you know, a grand a day at least. Mm -hmm. um, we were there for, what, three weeks maybe? Yeah. Just yeah. about three weeks or not, maybe not every, we had a few days off, but pretty much three weeks solid. 
Um, so that saved us a huge wedge of money there. But he's just come from sources of papers at times. Let me know. Like, it was a bit of a surprise when, when the guy said to me we could have it for free. <laughs> you know, I didn't expect that. Um, and other things like Alex, our DP, he owned his own camera already. Um, and because it's all in one location, it's, it's kind of easier that way. We don't have to move locations. We can set up at the beginning and leave everything how it is. We don't have to spend, you know, ages setting up, de-rigging, et cetera, mm -hmm. and moving things about. So in that terms, that was pretty straightforward. I know, Anthony, if there's any more on difficulties budgeting from your end as a producer. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always going to get tricky. And, you know, sometimes you're going to have to go into your own pockets. But it's like, like Nathan was saying, you're always going to find someone who's willing to invest. Not necessarily it has to be monetary, but the vision. If they see the vision, then they're going to want to be part of it and they're going to want to offer, you know, whether it's uh, offering, you know, an apartment or, you know, their own equipment. It's, it's, it's mainly, and I think that goes for any film, you know, whether it be feature short or even like TV and web series, like if they see the vision, then they're going to want to be part of it. So I think we got lucky in terms of, we, de well, we definitely got lucky in terms of that apartment, but um, in terms of, you know, the storyline, the characters, but also this period now, you know, a lot of the, the pledges that crowdfunded, they're seeing that, you know, this film is being streamed in all these different territories, you know, it's going on Amazon Prime, it's going on YouTube, it's gonna, you know, lay it down the line, Google Play, so all these, mm -hmm. you know, all these platforms, so that's exciting, you know, and I think that's, that's, that's the whole thing with independent film. People are buying into it and uh, they want to be part of it. So whether that comes with a financial gain or, you know, offering a service to help, I think that's how we got through this film, to be honest. You know, it was, it was all through that. I also, think there's a lot of grit to it as well. I remember the, the day before, we had to get all, all the, the like, furniture and stuff. So I was with mm -hmm. my mate Dalibor and we didn't have I anything or really any money. So I went round in my local area in Epsom just on free cycle to see everything we could get for free. And there was some really decent stuff. Let's go to one place in Shoreditch, got this really nice chair. It was kind of broken. The chair that you sat on, um, yes. Darnell sat on, was kind of broken, I think. It wouldn't move or something like that. But even <laughs> at the time, like we, we could, I couldn't find a table. There's no tables on free cycle that were kind of fixed. That's like a coffee table pipe. So, so I thought, oh, I lived above this guitar shop and they've always got these pallets. You know, like um, everything comes delivered on. So I went downstairs and said, mate, can I have some of those pallets? He was like, yeah, sure, have as many as you want. There was none. They'd all gone. Someone had nicked them all the night before. So <laughs> what were we going to do? But up the, down the road from me, there was um, like a builder's merchant, like Juicens or Wix or something like that. I can't remember what it's called. Mm. So I just called them up and said, mate, if you've got any pallets, I can have for free. Broken ones, doesn't matter. And they're like, yeah, cool, just come around. And we went out there, picked up, cut the pallets, drove around, <laughs> me and Danibor in this little van, driving around all these posh houses, just chucking all the furniture in the back <laughs> of the van. It looks a bit weird. But um, we, yeah, we just, just in the nick of time, managed to get it all there. So it was very much just not uh, our makeup the... artist. She was actually a student. Uh, mm. um, and yeah, the job that she did, Ella, was absolutely incredible with regard to you know, all the effects, doing Darnell's scar and mm -hmm. and where she lived, um, I don't want to get it wrong with the location, but they did a, a news article on her, you know, makeup, makeup artists, uh, first feature film, uh, you know, makeup artists heading for Hollywood. And it was just, <laughs> nice. you know, it's so, it was crazy. Like all the way, the kind of the trajectory of, you know, talking to her tutor, um, getting her on board, um, and then uh, seeing her in a newspaper. I mean, it's great. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's all these leads, which are, which are amazing. Um, yeah. I mean, so what I'm kind of picking up from that is one is, uh, you know, for indie filmmakers is the need to be resourceful, definitely. And the need to kind of get people to sort of buy into your, story and kind of feel that they can be part of that in whatever way that they can and uh, Anthony you touched on something earlier about kind of 
you know, you finding the sort of right distributor for you? And how did that sort of process sort of come about? Mm -hmm. um, so, so producer Phil, who actually ca he came on, he came to visit set, but again, he had worked, we'd worked together. Um, he actually sorted out the logistics for my the first feature film that I did, Sweet Boy, getting that, you know, getting us a um, broadcast deal. He's, um, we'd also, a project that I have in development, he was working on, he was, sort, he was you know, sorting out in terms of like major opportunities, trying to get finance in. Mm. His background was actually in finance. So he, he had come on set, he'd met Nathan. <laughs> he was actually playing darts in the pub, which mm. is just so random. He was playing darts in the pub. I had no idea that he was actually going to be <laughs> in the pub. <laughs> but he was playing darts in the pub and we saw him and we said, yeah, we're, we're filming a feature here. So then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then he ca he came upstairs he met all the cast um <clears throat> and yeah i mean in terms of it jo joe and nathan um started a dialogue with him uh phil would watch the film he'd actually put it forward to several um distributors and he found one which was who's based um gentleman called Morris who's based in Berlin and he 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 loved the film and yeah from there it was kind of we're on to something but it, it's not I'm, I'm telling this story in maybe in, in about two minutes or so but it's kind of it, it, it took it took a while to get the right distributor and to find you know Morris it's not yeah it's not, yeah I mean I, I think um, people particularly as a lot of our <laughs> audience are not filmmakers or you know uh, part of the filmmaking process and much more film lovers and people watching them I guess they don't understand uh, they wouldn't intuitively know like how important and integral distributors are to the process and how difficult it actually is to kind of source the right distributor for your film um, and that's that they effectively you know get your film out to the world and um, and that's the thing it, it's it's sorry to about it's it's, there are there were times as well. I mean, with me and Joe primarily, where I was, you know, we didn't know if the film would see the light of day. Mm. So there were times where I was thinking, should we just put it out there? Because I'm always of the mindset of, you know, necessarily it, that might not be the kind of quote unquote proper way. Just put it out there without a distributor. Mm. But I always believe in my in the back of my head, we've got. A great product, you know, mm. the done well on festivals, had good reviews, that it'd be a success anyway. So the way I see this is this is a bonus to have a distributor on board. But I was always of the belief that the film would do well, you know, that, that it's a success anyway. Making it is a success. Making the film alone is a success. Nathan, and that's credit to Nathan, um, Nathan, Alex, the whole team, Patrick. Um, but now it's now we've got the next step where we're you know we're doing we're doing press we're trying to get the film out there but you know it's 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 not easy but this is this is this is it you know it's a risk reward you know so um, on that note um, I, you guys have both sort of done uh, your fair amount of uh, short films as well and what. Do you feel that, um, I, I guess, often short films are seen as a sort of like gateway to a feature length film? But um, in my like personal opinion, I think they stand alone as actually important film content in, in, in of themselves. And um, do you think there are enough ways that filmmakers like yourselves who've both done features and do shorts have avenues to sort of um share or um ah oh, nathan's back uh, uh sorry. avenues to sorry someone tried to call me and it just mute i'm on the phone so it's all muted sorry. that's all right um so i was just kind of going on sh uh, on about short films and the need for more platforms that help specialize in short films or do audience um do you feel sort of treat short films in the same way that they do 
independent films in terms of how they engage with it? Oh, that's a difficult one. No, I don't think audiences generally do. The, the general public probably don't watch as many short films as um, they should or as we would like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you see it all the time, what the Avengers making billions and billions of dollars when there's so many small and indie films that, you know, don't just don't get the attention, even if they had the, the, the big marketing budget. People just, a lot of people, you know, I don't want to put everyone in the same boat. There's a lot of content people are missing because so many people just flock to what they know. Mm -hmm. um, they want a bit of familiarity with it as well, with the franchise and stuff. So it's, it's really, really hard getting people to watch short films. You think to make a short film, you know, to get a good budget for it, it's almost impossible because they never make that money back. Getting it films hard, getting people to watch it is the hardest thing, absolutely. Even, even your friends and family, getting them to sit down for 10 minutes and watch something. Um, <laughs> well, that's impossible, man. That's absolutely impossible. If you're going to glue them to the seat, <laughs> you know, get things in their lives and like clock lock orange, you know. <laughs> I don't know, like, yeah, I kind of agree with you, Nathan. I think if you find the right platform, like on YouTube especially, I think in terms of the, the short film market, it's, it's, it's really tricky because there's just millions. And same with the features, I guess. There's just the market is overcrowded. Um, but I think I think YouTube is definitely allowed in terms of short. I mean, obviously, you're not you might not get much money back from it um, because you're just putting it out there for free. But you definitely you definitely gain an audience. Um, so that's I mean that's what we did with Spa. We just put it straight on YouTube. We just said, you know, hopefully you like it. You know, hopefully you learn something from it. And yeah, a lot of people flocked in, but that, that, I guess that's testament to the platform that we put on, mm -hmm. um, UK fully focused. They've got a huge amount of subscribers, but, um, I mean, in terms of, it's a weird one now with, with this, you know, with COVID, it's almost like a free market and it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's going to be interesting how things, you know, the new normal, you know, how films are how films are seen now are people going to be going to the cinema now you know mm. and speaking well, of the idea uh, sorry familiarity uh, that nathan you're kind of speaking about before does the i guess sort of the uh, the delaying of some of the more uh, bigger tentpole films allow for indie films absolutely wiggle in yeah, I think yeah, I think definitely maybe a bit of a silver lining to to COVID, with with the amount of like major productions, whether it's you know big studios, you know Marvel, Disney, Warner Brothers, whatever, that they've been making less. You know, they literally can't. They're least becoming a shortfall in content that that companies like Netflix and Amazon um, need to show. You know, the, the, these massive films and series that they that they kind of rely on as their tentpole. Um, franchises have been so delayed, but they don't want to lose any the subscribers at all. I mean, they're, they're still businesses; they still need to make X amount of money per month. So, I've, from what I've heard, not technically what I've experienced so much, um, but these companies are looking at more independent films now as as a way to get people in. And you know, there's a lot of people, myself included, who have an awful lot more free time than normal now. So they're watching so much more Netflix and Amazon, you know. People binge watching it all day. Hopefully, they'll see new things, um, you know, and push themselves to continue seeing new things in future when when the world's a bit back to normal. I think as well, like just to conclude with that. I mean, in terms of like with the cinema, I don't necessarily. Obviously, COVID's a it's a massive problem, but I I don't think I feel like cinema was heading. And I'm a massive fan of cinema. Like I've been I've been to the cinema a few times to recent, not as much, but in the recent months. But I feel like it, it was heading in a similar direction. And I think that's kind of testament to the power of kind of Amazon and Netflix. People just want to be watching films at home. I'm not judging whether that's a good or a bad thing. And like I like I said, I support the cinema wholeheartedly. Um, I don't I think the cin cinematic experience is nothing like it, but people mm -hmm. Are watching films at home they're, they're on their netflix every weekend <laughs> this was happening this was happening before covid it's not just like covid's coming cinema's over 
-hmm. this was there were problems there were problems in the cinema um people they're, they're streaming everything now everything so i think that's a benefit for us but at the same time it's like you just got to think of new options it's new mm -hmm. options to market to market your film uh, yeah. i think you know to, to, to go off that i think the you know, issue that the cinemas have it you know that they always have to cater to their audiences you know because their overheads are so high they have to make money for example where i live it's a really sort of suburban proper family area you know people can't kind of move around here to have families and there's one Odeon here, and I think it's got about six screens. All they show are like family films. Mm -hmm. you know, if I want to watch, you know, a film that's not like Frozen, uh, for example, <laughs> they, they, might, they might have it one screening a week, maybe two screenings a week. And, you know, it, it could be an awkward time if I'm, you know, if I'm not here, if, if I've got some work on it, I can't go and see this film at, you know, nine o'clock on a, on a Thursday night because it just doesn't really fit in. So... To have Netflix, and this is not just me who, who goes through this, there's loads of people, to have the convenience of being able to watch things at home when you want, even watch on your way to work on the train or whatever, it's so easy. You know, it's, it's difficult for the cinemas to keep up with that, with, you know, the, the other things have to face, like, you know, the overheads and the cost of running a cinema in um, in, in, the, in 2020. I mean, how, how do cinemas, in your opinions, how do they pivot in to be sustainable and to yeah to kind of keep afloat well um, yeah nathan go for it oh no so i don't think i have an answer really like what what can they do if if you know they're making 90 percent of their money through family films especially like the one here mm. why why change that you know it's a difficult i don't have a proper answer to it it's a difficult question mm. i think i i mean it's a risky one i i do feel that cinemas maybe need to try and champion independent film more um mm. you've got your you've got your fridays your saturday sundays for your studio films obviously that's going to take you know a large amount of the gate um and if it's a good thing stay on it but i sometimes feel that the kind of theatrical industry don't realize the potential that and the audience that independent film has so maybe if it's on your Monday morning, you know, you, you get in a screening of scales, great audience, you know, full of people that back the film, crowdfunded it, you know, bring a certain amount of money to the gate. That's that, I mean, that's my, I'm, that's just an option. But I, I think when options aren't considered, you're just going to be on the same trajectory. Hmm. And uh, lastly, um, when is uh, Scales released and when can audiences, yeah, kind of um, see the film and get their hands on a copy? So, yes, uh, this Friday, um, it's going to be available on Amazon Prime and also YouTube. Um, it's free. November. That's... Yeah, 27th. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, please, please, please uh, tune in. Please stream it. Please watch it um it's uh it's, it's a great film you know great characters great directing a great story um and again it's it was it's, it's, a, it's a small budget it's a small film but um it's you know it shows you that anything's possible so it's been a long time coming as well so you know, yeah. it's, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be worth the wait for everyone i'm trying to guarantee it yeah We've got, yeah, our crowdfunders have been waiting and asking. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, uh, Nathan, Anthony, uh, thank you very much for joining us today on the Big Picture Film Club podcast. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Cheers.